I'm going to have my drama team perform a, a drama in just a moment if they'll come and get close. In this session, if you'll go ahead and start settling down, I'm going to need every bit of the time that I, that I have. I want to make sure that the sound guys and my videos guys, they should know, but I want to be sure that they know that at the end of my session, I'm going to be showing a video. I am going to be showing a video. Do, they, do you know that? You know that. Okay, good. Thank you. Just want to make sure everything's going to go smooth for me here. How many of you love romance? I love romance as well. I am, I am a romantic sucker, okay? I love, I love candles, I love soft music, I love the lights down low. In fact, if you go to my house, I have a jacuzzi tub in my bedroom. Not in my bathroom, in my bedroom, okay? So I am a romantic nut, and I don't know if my wife is near. Is my wife near? Do you, does anybody know if my wife is near? Is my wife right there? Sweetheart, I know you hate when I do this, but I, I've got to do this, sweetheart. Could someone escort my wife up here real quick? This is the love of my life and my best friend. And today is our 15th anniversary. And I also have a gift certificate. I want you to go buy you some clothes in the next couple of days for our cruise. All right. We're going on a cruise Saturday. So Friday night, when I say goodbye to you, I'm saying goodbye, friend. Last year, whenever Cheryl came and she, she said, Brother Richard, we need to do the conference during this week. I said, we can't do it during that week. That's my anniversary. And uh, she said, Richard, please, please. So I went to my wife and I said, sweetheart, they're needing to do our conference during uh, our anniversary next year. And it's our 15th anniversary. I said, if I was to take you on a cruise after the conference, would you forgive me? She said, consider yourself forgiven. So... I have the most incredible wife and the most incredible children in the whole wide world, and, um, and I also have the most incredible youth group in the whole wide world. But to, to th this afternoon, this afternoon, I wanna, I'm going to talk real straight to you about romance. Some of you have heard some of my teaching, and um, others of you have not, but um, I want to ask you... I want to ask you to be open tonight to the word of the Lord, to this afternoon, to the word of the Lord. If I say anything to you of my personal opinion, I want you to throw it out the window and say he's a lunatic. But if I preach to you the word of God, I challenge you to adhere to it. See, we, we date. The reason we date, most, most teenagers will tell you, well, why do you date? And we say the reason we date is to get to know one another and to get ready for marriage. And uh, that really, if you think about it, it's really funny because... On dates, you really don't get to see it and get to know one another very well. Because, fellas, you ask your girl out, and if she accepts, on Friday when she gets home from school at 3.30, you're supposed to pick her up at 7 o'clock. She, she immediately goes from the bus or from the car to the bed, bathroom, and she'll take five or six showers. She'll put on about 15 different outfits. She'll try, she'll try her hair 15 different ways, and, 
and she wants to look her best. I mean, she'll spend four hours getting ready for you. And nowadays, guys are just as bad as the girls. Guy, the guys will primp and stand, stand in front of the bedroom, uh, in front of the mirror for hours trying to get ready. And, and he'll pull up for that first date and he's nervous and he's, you know, he's anxious and he pulls up in the, in the driveway. And, and, and he'll be a perfect gentleman that night. He'll walk up to the front door and he'll knock on the door and, 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 and you'll come out and you'll look lovely. And, and he will, for the very first time in his life, open the door for you when he gets to the car. Very first time he's ever opened a door for a young lady. And by the way, young ladies, if they don't open the door for you, don't go through it. But he'll open the door for you, and, and you know what he'll do on that first date? He'll take you to one of the nicest restaurants in town. And he will, he will have rememorized all of his best jokes. And he will be the perfect gentleman. He'll, tell, he'll, he'll try to entertain you and woo you and tell you all of his best jokes. And of course, young ladies, you're going to laugh at his jokes even if you don't understand them. And, and, and you will be so polite. And, and, and at, by the end of the evening, by the end of the evening, you ladies feel like that you have met your Prince Charming. He has swept you off your feet. And he goes home and he dreams about you for days and and you just know that you know that you know you've met the right one. The only problem is, is, and then you start this regular dating relationship, and the only problem with that is this. After about three months, he doesn't quite spend as much time to get ready for you, sweetheart. In fact, he'll go straight from changing the oil in his car to picking you up. And he'll come, and his hands will be greasy, and his hair will be greasy, and he had not brushed his teeth in a week. And he'll sit out in the car, and he'll start honking the horn. That, that, that. Where is that woman? Ladies, if he ever sits in the car and honks the horn, don't you even come outside. He'll honk the horn, and where's that girl at? My land, she's always late. He'll sit in the car and won't even get out to open the door for you, and then you get in the car and he takes you to some greasy, cheap, slimy old place in town. And, and he'll, he'll slurp pizza in front of you and, 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 and spaghetti and he'll pick his nose in front of you and he'll belch and let off all kinds of bodily noises in the car. And you'll get all fed up and you'll go, you're not the Prince Charming I fell in love with. And he'll go, well, you ain't no princess either. And the problem is this. You fall in love with someone that they're really not. See, in dating, you really don't get to get to know one another because what you're doing is you put on your best mask, you put on your best behavior, you put your best foot forward. Why? Because, young lady, you want him to ask you out again. And son, you want her to say yes. And so you, you're sure to always put on your best person. And you win their heart, you win their affection, you win their commitment and devotion. And then after you feel like that you've won them over, the real you comes out. And then everybody is sick. Hearts are wounded, lives are destroyed, fantasies are diminished. And you find yourself hurting and alone once again. I'm going to talk real straight to you for the next hour about what I feel like the Bible says and how you are to find you a mate. But I want my drama team to perform real quick and um, help me out with it. Huh? This is depicting this is depicting a first date among teenagers. Would you give it up for our drama team? Probably have a bruise now. 
But at least I'm at the theater with Sue. Oh, shoot. What is he looking at? Do I have a zit on my nose? Or what is he looking at? She's beautiful. She almost looks like a Greek goddess. Uh, oh, man. The movie's starting. Man? Good. The movie's starting. Maybe John will stop looking at me now. Maybe I should put my arm around her. Should I? Wait a minute. Did I put on deodorant? I can't remember. Let me check. What is he doing? Whew. Thank goodness I remembered to put that on. Now, should I put my arm around her now? Or should I wait till the love scene? I think... He is acting really weird. I've never seen him like this. I wonder what the matter is. Eeny, meeny, miny, moe, catch a tiger by his toe. If he hollers... I think he might be a little nervous. After all, this is the first time that we've been to the movies together. Maybe I should give him some... Bubblegum, bubblegum in a dish. How many pieces do you wish? Five? Five karate experts versus a pizza delivery boy? How realistic can this be? Okay, I'm going to do it, and I'm going to do it now. I'll try the stretch approach. Here goes nothing. Hey, buddy, put your arm down. I can't see. Great. Just great. I just made a total fool of myself. I wonder if Sue noticed. I wonder if John realizes I saw that whole thing. Well, I guess I should try again. Okay, here we go. Uh, excuse us. Great. Again, I don't make it. Excuse us. I'd like to excuse him, all right. I'd like to... Go to a more realistic movie. This is the worst movie I've seen in my entire life. Okay, I'll try it again. I'll be more direct this time. Here we go. Go for it! Go for it! Ah, did I know what I'm trying to do? Kill him! Yeah! <sighs> Get a hold of yourself, John. You're so nervous that you think... John is acting rather weird. Okay, let's try this one more time. Here we go. Wow! She's holding my hand! This is great! I can't... Ah! Oh my goodness! Oh. 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 I wonder if Sue saw that. What is his problem? Does he think I'm going to bite? Man, he's acting really weird. Good. She didn't notice. Maybe I'll just wait a little bit before I try that again. Okay, here we go. This time I'm going to put my arm around her, and I'm going to keep it there. Here we go. Yes! I made it! Wait a minute. What are those? The credits! Well, that was an okay movie. I just wish John would have put his arm around me a little earlier. For those of you who are interested in putting together drama ministries, um, that's one of the 12 skits that we have in our new drama book that's coming out called Arts Ablaze, and you can uh, look at it in the bookstore and you can order that if you're interested. But how many of you realize that dating can be a very uh, painful experience? I was, um, I was what you might call a late bloomer. I didn't kiss, I didn't kiss my first girl until I was in 10th grade. And... Um, uh, it wasn't because I didn't want to, it was just I didn't really have that many opportunities or didn't have the guts, but, and I remember, I remember going through a lot of torture in my early teen years, worrying about kissing a girl and worrying about the whole dating scene. In fact, I'll never forget one day I was in 10th grade and I was sitting, I was sitting in typing class and guys, how many of you know that girls can be very cruel? Girls, girls can be vicious, friend. In fact, in fact, some of you girls ought to have your tongue registered at the local police department as a lethal weapon. <laughs> girls can make a guy feel about this big in no, no second flat, you know what I'm saying? I was sitting in typing class, though, and, and, and there was these girls behind me. Now, I want you to understand, I've not kissed a girl yet at this time in my life. 
and uh, outside my mama. And, um, and uh, but anyway, I was sitting in typing class, and I just know that these girls knew that I had never kissed a girl before. And, and, and I know that they were just wanting to torment me because they were right behind me. And, and I wasn't trying to eavesdrop. It was just that they were talking just loud enough for me to hear. And the topic of their discussion was the way that different guys kiss at our school. And I remember them saying, oh, so-and-so, he's sloppy, and so-and-so, he's dry, and so-and-so, you know, and I'm, the whole time I'm sitting there trying to type, and I'm cringing and melting in my seat because I haven't kissed a girl yet, and I'm, I'm thinking, you mean they talk about this stuff when they get together? And I remember, I remember just breaking out in a sweat thinking, I wonder what they're going to say about me. And, and I remember I was tormented. In fact, I was tormented to, to the extent that I remember that same year I had a dream. And I don't, have, I don't remember very many dreams, but this dream was so vivid and so real that, that it has stuck with me that I can even remember the details today. And I remember I was in this old stagecoach, this horse-drawn stagecoach like they used to have in the 1800s, you know. And, and I was with this girl, and I don't even remember who the girl was, but I remember I was with this girl, and, and we were riding along, and, and obviously we had a thing for one another, and we finally got to our final destination, and she was going to get out of the stagecoach, when lo and behold, she turned to me, and we kissed. And I was so, listen, I was so excited. I remember, I remember, I went, hallelujah, I did it, 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 I did it. I finally kissed this girl. And I was so excited. And then I woke up. And I went into immediate depression. I was like, oh, dear God, I still haven't done it. And then I remember in 10th grade, I was, dating this, I was dating this girl who was two years older than me, and she was an experienced woman. And I remember, I remember, well, you got to remember, I had no experience, so anybody was experienced. Yeah. And I remember, I remember we were standing on the front porch when I had my very first kiss. And we were, we were kissing and all of a sudden, my eyes popped open because there was this foreign object in my mouth. I had no idea what was going on. Can we say ignorant? We're talking about, we're talking about Dumbville here, friend. I had no idea what was happening. I was like, that's her tongue. This is gross. But, but how many of you realize that dating, if you really think about it, dating is funny. And dating can be very painful. Many of you, many of you have bought the lie that unless you have a young man on your arm or a young lady on your arm that you're not worth anything. The society tells you that if you don't have a date on Friday night, that you're just not with it. And, and, and can I confess to you that for 12 years in my youth ministry, I would teach my young people about how to date in a Christian way. But about four and a half years ago, I was sitting at my desk and I had pulled out materials that I had bought through the years. I'm talking about hundreds of dollars worth of materials. And I like to teach in series. Um, and the, the reason I like to teach in series is because teenagers don't hear you the first time. I said, teenagers don't hear you the first time. And, um, I mean, you can ask any parent, and they'll tell you that their teenager never... I never heard my mom tell me to take out the trash until she either added my middle name or hit a certain pitch in her voice. And uh, so I like to preach in series, and I've always done the love, sex, dating thing. I like to do it in, around February, March. I always do the love, sex, dating thing. And February, March is really a perfect time to do it because you have Valentine's, you got spring fever, as, as sap rises within trees, hormones are rising within teenagers, their clothes are coming off, their love's in the air, you got prom that they're thinking about, and it's just really a perfect time to deal with the subject. And I was sitting at my desk, and I, I had all this material out, 
when all of a sudden the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and he said these words. He said, Richard, would you stop teaching what other men have taught you and would you go to the Word of God and begin to teach what the Word of God says about biblical romance? And young people, I have to confess to you that I was shocked when I went to the Word of God and I found out that I could not find anywhere in Scripture where it taught about dating. In fact, I will say this to you, if anybody in this arena can show me anywhere in Scripture that supports anything that has to do with dating as we now practice it today, I will burn every bit of my material and I'll never preach this message again. But friend, let me tell you something. You will not find scripture that will support the dating practices that we have today. And you have got to realize, young people, that we are called to be a peculiar people, a different people. And that this book right here is good for every area of our life or let's throw the whole thing away. We don't pick and choose what areas that we're going to apply to our life. And so for the last four and a half years, I've been teaching my young people, and, and out of 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 32, we start here, and, and this is what that scripture says. It says in verse 32 of 1 Corinthians chapter 7, it says, I would have you to be free from concern. Now, how many of you would like to be free from concern? Let me hear you. Wouldn't you love to be free from concern? And Paul says this. Paul says, I want to share with you something that's going to set you free. And young people, some of you, this will be the very first time you're going to hear it, and you're going to think, Brother Richard's on planet Mars. Others of you are going to be ready to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying tonight. But listen to me. I share this with you tonight, this afternoon, because I'm a veteran youth pastor and I know the dangers in which dating puts teenagers in. I care about you. I love you. I have no axe to grind. I have no point to prove. I have no pedestal to climb up on. I just want you to be free from concern and I want you to enjoy life to the fullest. And so I'm sharing with you what Paul shared with the Corinthian church in, in verse 32. And he said, I would want you to be free from concern. And then he goes on to say, and I'm going to paraphrase, he says this. A single man can go after God with all of his heart, but a married man is divided in his affection. A single woman can go after God with all of her heart, but a married woman is divided in her affection. And I've been challenging my teenagers now for over four years to stop practicing dating as we now know it and spend this time of your life going after Jesus. I challenge my teenagers. Psalms 90 verse 10 says this. Psalms 90 verse 10 says that you are promised 70 years on, on earth. You're promised 70 years of life. How long will you be a teenager? 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Seven years. I challenge you in this building this, this afternoon to give your teen years as your tithe years to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the only time in your life, teenagers, that you will be able to go after Jesus without any distractions. This is the only time because in a few more years you're going to be married and you're going to have to be worried, you're going to have to be concerned about taking care of your wife, taking care of your children, making sure the bills are paid and everything else. This is your only time. And what the devil wants to do is he wants to rob you of your youth. He wants to rob you of this precious time that you have that you can become a powerhouse soldier for Christ and get you chasing britches and skirts. I want to challenge you to look a little closer at the dating system. Youth pastors, listen to me. We don't like talking like this, but listen to me carefully. Statistic after statistic after statistic has proven that teenagers like those in this building today who grow up in church are just as sexually involved as teenagers out in the world. We would be astonished 
If you would be honest, and if I'm not going to do this, but if you would be honest, and if I was to ask you, if you're not a virgin, would you stand in this room? We would be blown away at how many have already lost their virginity. And something confuses me. Why are our Christian teenagers just as sexually involved as kids out in the world? And it doesn't make sense to me because I know you youth pastors get in your pulpits and you say stuff like this. Save yourself for marriage. Save yourself for marriage. Save yourself for marriage. You have them tr sign true love weights cards and worth the weight cards. And friend, I'm not against those programs. We passed out 5,000 true love weight cards last year in the school system. I'm not against those programs. But listen to me, friend. Why are our teenagers still sexually involved when we are trying to preach to them physical purity? I think it is because we are no longer preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, but we're trying to Christianize an American version. Listen to me carefully, young people. You realize that dating's only about 150 years old, don't you? See, dating came with cars. Before you had cars, you didn't have dating. You had a process called courtship, which we'll talk about in just a few moments. Listen to me. And I just want to ask you, listen, I want to ask you to please open yourself up to the word of the Lord and not close something out just because you don't like it or just because you've never heard it before. I've said it before. I haven't come here to make friends this week. I've come to preach the gospel. Now listen to me. If dating is so wonderful, somebody tell me why we have the highest divorce rate in the world. You realize that if you were born in the year 1985 or since then, and you're of the white race, you only have a 30% chance in America of reaching the age 17 living with both of your biological parents. 30%. If you go to the black race, it drops down to seven. We've got to admit, young people, there is a problem in America. There's a problem with our marriages, and I think it's because they're built upon shaky ground. See, I do not believe that dating gets us ready for marriage. I believe it gets us ready for divorce. Because breaking up is hard to do, but the more you do it, the easier it becomes. Young people, think about it. Whenever you start talking about love, sex, and dating, what's the very first question that teenagers ask you? How far is too far, Brother Richard? And you could talk to 10 different youth pastors and get 10 different answers. Why? It's because, it's because we're asking a question, young people, that should have never been asked. When I read my Bible... The Word of God tells me that we are to save sex for marriage. We are to save all sex for marriage. But because we have created in recent years a new social order that we refer to as dating, we have to come up with a whole new set of guidelines because, see, we have premarital sexual activity that's okay and postmarital sexual activity that's okay, and we're all the time wondering where the boundary's at. Let me give you a case in point. Let's just say that one day I went home from work early and did not tell my wife, and I went in the front room, and when I walked in the front room, I catch my wife sitting on the couch with my next-door neighbor, and they're kissing, and they're embraced in each other's arms. Immediately I go, hey, what's going on here? And my wife goes, ah, it's okay, Richard. We're not sexually involved. I go, oh, shoo, for a minute there, I thought y'all were sexually involved. Go ahead, sweetheart, I'm sorry. Now, don't talk to me about the movies. Don't talk to me about society. Somebody show me in this book right here, because this is the only thing that I'm interested in. If it's not okay for my wife, why is it okay for teenagers to do that? You don't have to clap if you don't want to. I'm just, I'm just want you to think about it. Young people, I want to make it real clear. I do not say that dating is sin. People misquote me all the time. 
I do not say that dating is sin, but let me tell you what I will tell you. Dating promotes sinful activity. And youth pastors, we have for years taught our teenagers to get involved in sexual activity and sexual sins by encouraging them to date around. Let me explain myself to you. When's the last time you heard a sermon on defrauding? Do you even know what defrauding is? Defrauding is a sexual sin that teenagers commit every Friday night on a date. Defrauding is in the Bible. Look it up, friend. You'll find one of them there in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, where it says that a, that a woman, when she's married, does not own her own body, but it belongs to her husband. And her husband's body doesn't belong to him, but it belongs to his wife. And they are not to hold sexual activity from one another, except for in the case of fasting. And then it goes on to say, and then after they get through fasting, they are to come back together sexually so that they do not defraud one another. Now what's defrauding? Defrauding is this, young people. Young ladies, when you wear a tight sweater or a high skirt, you walk in such a way and prince around in such a way and flirt around with the guys in your youth group and get them turned on. You are defrauding your brother in Jesus. <laughs> Young lady, listen to me carefully. You're in the back seat of the car, and the, and the windows are starting to steam up. And you know what? You hadn't even gotten into petting yet. We don't even go, we won't even deal with petting. I tell my young people, if you've got to pet something, buy a dog. You don't even have to get into petting. Okay, let's leave that out. You don't even have to, but you're in the back seat and, and you're, you're heavy into the kissing the scene and, and you're getting hot and bothered. Let me tell you something, young lady. When you arouse your brother in Jesus sexually and you cannot gratify it outside the marriage bed, you have committed the sin of defraud. You have defrauded your brother and the Bible says defrauders will go to hell. And youth pastor, we tell our young people, as long as you don't pet, as long as you keep it above the neck, it doesn't matter how hot and bothered you get, you, it's okay. I'm telling you, it's not okay. <laughs> young man, when you start saying your little sweet nothings in her ear, and you start caressing her hair, and you start stirring up sexual desires inside of her that you cannot gratify outside the marriage bed, you are committing a sin against your sister. And the Lord will hold you accountable one day. We teach them not only to commit the sin of defrauding, but we teach them to commit the sin of inordinate affections. Look it up in the Bible, young people. It's in the Bible. Inordinate affections is a sin. It's when your affections are out of order. Affections are to follow commitment, not vice versa. I tell my young people the most important questions to ask in life are the why questions. Because the reason you do something is more important than what you do. And the other day I was driving down the road and, and as you can probably already tell, this is one of my passions. Because I, and the, here's the reason why, young people, I'm not trying to restrain you, I'm trying to set you free. And I have seen too many teenagers' lives destroyed through this process that we're talking about right now. And the other day I was driving down the road and I was thinking about the marriage ceremony. I think the marriage ceremony is a beautiful ceremony. But I was, I was thinking about it. I was asking why questions. Why do we do this, that, and the other? You know, why does the father escort the bride down the aisle? And then the preacher says, who gives this man to be married to this woman? And he says, her mother and I. And then the groom comes down and, and he takes her arm and he puts it inside the groom's arm and he steps back. Why do we do that? It's to symbolize the fact that that young lady is never outside the protection of male authority. And, and, and then at the end of the ceremony, you, you, have, you have a young couple come down, a, a beautiful bride come, and a, and a groom, a fine young man, and, and they come, and, and in the presence of godly people, in the presence of God himself, and in front of a man of God, in the ceremony, they make vows to one another, they make commitments to one another, they exchange rings and tokens of commitments that they're making, 
And after, listen, after all those commitments are made, after all those vows are made, at the very end of the ceremony, the preacher says these words. He looks at the young man and he says, Young man, you may now kiss your bride. Why do we say that? Have you ever wondered why? Why why does the preacher say that? Is it because we like to watch people kiss in public? Or could there be more of a meaning to it than that? Now, I don't tell my young people they can't kiss at all, but this is what I do challenge them to do. I challenge them. I say, listen, your marriage would be a whole lot stronger if you'll refrain from kissing. And right now, I do more marriages in Brownsville than anybody else. In fact, I did a wedding Saturday. Andrea, our junior high minister, got married this, this Saturday. And, um, and, and at the end of the ceremony, when the preacher said, you may now kiss the bride, it was the very first time in their life that their lips ever met. And some of you right now are going, well, I could never do that. I just could not do that. Well, okay, you just go ahead and have that attitude. But let me tell you something. Can you imagine the kind of marriages that are being created whenever a young man makes a commitment so strong to a young lady that he won't even violate her by kissing her? And and, and after they get married, such strong commitments and trust and respect that they have for one another that whenever he's off on a business trip for a week, she's not at home wondering if he's sleeping with a prostitute in the hotel. Because she knows the kind of integrity the man had. And, and he's not at home wondering if she's sleeping with the milkman. Hello. Because there's a respect, there's a commitment, there's a trust that has, been, that has been made. I tell my young people, listen, whenever you get married, you don't want half of your youth group to know how your boyfriend kisses. Or your husband kisses. You realize, young people, that if you're 14, 15 years old, and even a, a couple of years older than that, and you go out with a young lady's son, let's say that you're 15 years old and she's 15, and you go out with her, and y'all are, y'all are hot and bothered, necking in the back seat somewhere, or in the living room, or wherever it might be, and you're kissing, and you know, let's not even go to petting. Let's not even go to petting. You realize if you're 15 years old, the odds of you marrying that girl is very, very slim. Can we be honest? The odds of you marrying a girl at age at 15 that you started dating is very slim. It happens every once in a while, but the odds are very slim, probably less than 1%. And if that's true, son, then that means that you're actually kissing somebody else's wife. See, young people, we teach, youth pastor, we teach physical purity, but we don't teach emotional purity. See, let me explain how, the best way I can explain emotional purity is this. I remember I went to Walmart once, and I bought, I, I was going to buy a CD player. And I went into the electronic place, and, I, and they had the CD player on sale, and the box was open, so I just opened it up again, and I took the CD out, and the player out, and I, I plugged it in, I punched the buttons, I listened to the radio, it sounded pretty good to me, and it was a cheap price, and so I, I wrapped it back up, and I put it back in the box, I closed the box, did I take that box home? No, I'm just like you are, friend. I put it back on the shelf, I reached behind, and I got one with the shrink wrap on it. You know what I challenge you, young people? Why don't you save the shrink wrap for your husband or your wife one day? Let me tell you something. Some of you are going, man, this is, this is weird. This is too tough. Let me tell you something. My young people love me because I teach this kind of stuff. My young ladies love it because I teach. I tell, I tell my young ladies, young ladies, raise the standard. Put a price tag on your head. Make him earn it. Make him earn it. And by the way, youth pastor, just do a survey sometime. Ask your young ladies how many times they went out on a date with a young man, not because they really, really wanted to, but because he was a nice guy and they did not want to hurt his feelings. 
Can I tell you something? A young lady should never have to say yes or no to a young man. That's what daddies are for. And let me tell you something, son. You go, oh, no, I'm not going to talk to her daddy. Let me tell you something, buddy. If you're not man enough to go talk to her daddy, you're not man enough to get married anyway. You're a wimp. <laughs> Ashley's in this room somewhere. She's 13 years old, my daughter. And uh, I love her with everything that's within me. And she... Um, no, I, I, would, I would introduce her to you, but she's very shy. She doesn't want me to do that. I love you, sweetheart. I just spared you. <laughs> listen. Listen to me. When she was 12 years old, when she turned 12 years old about a year and a half ago, my, my wife and I got someone to stay with my son, Caleb, which is my joy of my heart, too. Caleb's in here somewhere. I love you, buddy. And um, we got someone to stay with my son, Caleb, and, and we took Ashley out to the restaurant of her choice. We got all dressed up, took her out to a nice adult restaurant, and my daughter loves silver instead of gold. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And so I went down to Walmart, God's store. You know what I'm talking about? And uh, I told my wife, when I die, please bury me near Walmart. That way I'm sure you visit me every day, you know. But anyway, went down to Walmart and I bought these two necklaces. I bought these two necklaces and... Um, some of you may be even wearing some like this. One of, them, one of the necklaces is, is in the shape of a heart, and it has cut out of the heart the shape of a key, and engraved on the heart, it's, it has engraved these words, he who holds the key unlocks my heart. And the other necklace is a key. And I bought these two necklaces, and Ashley has heard me teach this teaching more times than you probably have eaten spaghetti. And... Um, and she loves, my, she loves me because of my standards and the way that I've protected her. And I, and I took these two necklaces and I slid them across the table at the end of the meal. And Ashley opened up the two necklaces and she looked at them and she knew immediately what was happening. And she took the necklace with the key and she slid it back across the table saying, Daddy, would you protect my heart? I said, would I protect your heart? <laughs> Friend, let me tell you something. No boy is going to stomp on my little girl's heart. Because how many of you know it's usually the girls that get stomped on? Let me tell you something, girls. Let me tell you, just, let me just say something to you real quick. Girls, in your youth group, there's a, guy, a lot of guys walking around in sheep clothing that are nothing but wolves inside. And listen, a lot of guys, listen girls, I'm telling you the way it is. A lot of guys look at you as nothing more than territory to conquer. They're looking at you as just something else to conquer. Guys want to conquer things. And as soon as he feels like he's conquered you, he'll leave you aside, wounded, broken, and, 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 and have stolen from you the precious things that should have been saved for your husband. And let me tell you something, no guy is going to stomp on my little girl's heart. And one of, the greatest, one of the greatest days of my life will be the day when my daughter walks down an, an, an aisle in a white gown that she truly deserves to wear. Today it's a mockery, friend. White stands for purity. Why don't we live up to it? She walks in an, out down an aisle in a, a white gown that she truly deserves to wear. And somewhere, somewhere during that ceremony, I'm going to come off the platform and I will take this necklace off my neck that I've been wearing every day of my life since that day. And I walk up to that young man. And I take the necklace and I put it around his neck and I say, Son, for so many years, I've protected her. I've cherished her. I've kept her pure and chaste and holy in every way. I've nurtured her and made sure that she was whole just for you. And today, I give you the key to unlock her heart. And from this day forward, it is your responsibility to protect her and to cherish her and to nurture her and to see that she's whole in every way. And if you don't... <laughs> How many 
many of you girls would like to have a daddy that would do that for you? And listen to me. Youth pastor, I want to challenge you to think about this topic once again. Some of you, this is the very first time you've heard anything like this. Youth pastor, you need to think about this topic because listen to me. You realize that dating is one of the most demonic strongholds that the devil has on your youth group? Every one of you have seen this in this room. You've got a guy, he's on fire for God. You've got a girl, she's on fire for God. They start seeing one another, and the whole church goes, Oh, that's God. I go, Oh, no, it's not. Because you watch them, friend. After a couple of months in that relationship, their relationship with Jesus starts going... And because there are no brakes on the vehicle... And hopefully they're godly enough that they don't want to commit fornication. The only way that they can stop is to jump out of the relationship. The guy starts dating another girl. The girl starts dating another guy. And now you have this wonderful thing called jealousy, envy, and division in your youth ministry. And you're constantly putting out fires. Youth pastor, take it. Please listen to, my, listen to me. I went for 12 years in youth ministries. Trying to put out fire after fire after fire. I preached my guts out about physical purity. And I would have teenager after teenager after teenager getting pregnant. Listen, you may not like my standards of holiness, but I got good news for Jesus. My teenagers aren't getting pregnant. And you will not come to my youth group and find guys and girls snuggled up and holding hands and googly eyes in one another, not listening to the sermon. You won't find guys and girls in my youth group sneaking around a corner and kissing somewhere in the bushes, friend. My guys and girls have been released from that bondage, and they can be friends with the, friends of the opposite sex without any pressure. My teenagers have a freedom and a liberty to be best friends with one another without everybody going, did you see who John just sat with? I think Susie and him are becoming a thing. Friend, there's a freedom there. I remember the very first time that I ever taught this series with my youth group. I brought up a big whiteboard in front of my teenagers. And I put at the top, positives. And then I listed categories. Physically, spiritually, emotionally, socially. Then I drew a line, negatives. Categories, physically, spiritually, emotionally, socially. And I said to my teenagers, I said, young people, tonight we're going to start a new series. But I'm not going to preach to you tonight. You're going to talk to me. And I said, the very first thing I want you to do is I want you to list for me all the positive things about dating. And I want you to put them in these categories, physically, spiritually, emotionally, and socially. Friend, my teenager's eyes got bigger saucers. Because listen, if you do this, you cannot deny the fact you cannot deny what I'm about to say. And, and for 10 minutes, they're punching one another. Hurry, come up with something. Hurry, hurry, hurry. We got to come up with some positive stuff. Because, friend, they knew I was fixing to eat their lunch. But I have a very creative bunch of teenagers. They came up with something positive in every category, including the physical category. This was, this was what they came up with. Dating promotes good health and hygiene. That's good. I mean, think about it. If you want to date, stay in shape, brush your teeth, right? In fact, I have written proof. Some, one of my teenagers brought me a couple of months ago written proof that this is true. They, they cut out an article out of the Family Circle magazine, and it's printed so I know that it's true, okay? It was, they, they brought me an article out of the Family Circus magazine that says this. The title of the article, it says... Kiss cavities away. And this is what the article said. It said, recent studies has found that kissing could be good for your teeth because as you kiss, the saliva juices begin to flow in your mouth, washing away food particles that are stuck in your teeth. Is that the grossest thing you've ever heard of? I mean, I could just imagine. 
You're sitting there kissing your girlfriend. You go, sweetheart, what did you just have for supper? <laughs> so there are benefits with dating. I don't deny that fact. You stay in shape, brush your teeth, okay? But listen. After about 10 minutes, friend, they had drained that bucket. I said, okay, guys. I said, now list for me all the negative things. I'm not exaggerating. For over an hour, as fast as I could write, both sides of the board was filled. It was 9.30. I usually try to give the all to call at 9.30 because a lot of my teenagers have tests on Friday. We have youth service on Thursday night. And uh, there were still 40 hands lifted. I said, put your hands down. We can't take them all. I said, we've got to go home, but I want to ask you one question for you to think about this week when you go home. Can you as Christian teenagers who believe that Jesus Christ wants the best for you and for your life, can you honestly look at this board and tell me that this is the will of God for you? I said, young people, I don't believe so. I said, you've been lied to. You've been lied to by the world and you've been lied to by the church. In that series, I asked my young people this question. I said, young people, how many of you believe that God has given you your parents to guide you and to protect you through life? Well, every Christian teenager believes that. God has given me my parents to guide me and to protect me. Yes, I, I agree with that. What's the most important decision you're ever going to make? Accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior. What's the second most important decision you're ever going to make in your life? Who are you going to spend the rest of your life with in holy matrimony? Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on, hold on, hold on. You tell me that God has given you your parents to guide you and to protect you, yet when it comes to the second most important decision you're ever going to make, you tell your parents to get out of your face, let you make up your own mind by your eyesight and your hormones, and then on the wedding day, Daddy, will you give me away? I don't think so, young people. And some of you are thinking, my lands, if my parents don't want me to date anybody, they don't ever approve of anybody. They just want me to be at home all my life. They, they just want me to be an old maid. Sweetheart, take it from me. I am a parent. They want you out of the house as bad as you want to get out of the house. And young people, youth pastors, listen. I could honestly, my, my staff and my young people can tell you this, I could talk about this subject for 10 hours straight and not miss a beat. I, I, I have so much material that I have inside of me. You notice I don't have any notes. I'm just talking from my heart. I have so much inside of me that I want to share, but I can't do that. But let me just channel, let, let me let you know, in the bookstore you can pick up, I have six hours of teaching with sermon notes, either video or audio, that you can pick up if you want more on this subject. But listen to me. Because I'm going to let you know, I, I've, I think that if you be honest with yourself, you can see that dating has a lot of loopholes in it. So, Brother Richard, how in the world, how in the world am I supposed to meet my man? How in the world am I supposed to meet my woman if, if you're not going to let me do the traditional dating scene? How, what's the Bible say? Well, I challenge you to study the Bible and look at certain stories such as Isaac and Rebecca, such as Ruth and Boaz, such as Mary and Joseph, such as, even as Samson and Delilah. You know, when I say D Samson, you automatically think of Delilah, but can I tell you something? Samson's problem was not Delilah. Samson's problem was he refused to submit to the biblical pattern of romance. If you look three chapters before Delilah, you'll see where Samson went wrong. Samson fell in love with a Philistine woman, and he began correctly. He went to his parents and he said, I want to marry her. And his parents said, no, Samson, she's not a godly woman. And Samson began to throw a fit. I want her! I want her! And when Samson throws a fit, Samson gets what he wants. Hello. He refused to submit. Listen, young people, he refused to submit to the godly wisdom that was birthed in his parents. And then the next chapter you see him fall in love with a second prostitute. Delilah is the third prostitute that he fell in love with. Young people, I'm telling you, you better listen to the biblical pattern of romance. I want to share with you the ideal 
But let me tell you what I'm more concerned about than the ideal. I want you to pick up on the principles of the things that I'm trying to share with you. First thing, here's the, here's the main principles that I want you to catch. The first one is this. Would you stop doing casual dating for entertainment purposes? Stop doing dating, casual dating for entertaining purposes. Because when you do that, all you do is hurt people. You're using people for your own pleasure and your own satisfaction. Stop dating for fun. Stop dating for entertainment. Dating is not, you don't mess with other people's hearts for your entertainment purposes. The second thing is this. Get your parents involved in your romantic life. You go, oh, gross. Listen to me. Your parents have a lot of godly wisdom. You go, my parents aren't saved. They still have godly instincts. They can still see things in friends that you don't see because there's some years of experience upon them. Get some authority over you to protect you because let me tell you something. Love is not only blind, but it's deaf also. And, and you, when, whenever you let your heart go out to some young lady, fellas, all of a sudden your senses fall to, fall to pieces. How many of you have ever had a friend who was in love with, let's just say girls, you had this girlfriend that was in love with this guy. And all she could talk about was how wonderful he was. I mean, you would think that he was, the, he was a god or something. And you look at him, and he's buck tooth. He's got zits all over the face. He, he's, he, he doesn't have any personality. And you're sitting at your girlfriend, and you're going, Girlfriend, what do you see in him? What has possessed you? What's your problem? How many of you have ever had a friend like that? You're sitting there going, They've won off the deep end. What do they see in the guy? You know what the problem is? Love is blind. That's good news for some of you fellows in this room. But young people, the second thing I beg you to do is, is get your parents, get your parents' approval in your relationships. When your parents disapprove of a friend or or a, a, a romance that you're wanting to stir. Listen to them. They're trying to protect you. And the third thing is this. Young people, don't start stirring up romantic feelings inside of yourself and inside of people of the opposite sex until you're old enough and ready to get married. In my book, that means if you're in high school, it's not time yet. Because here, here's the reason why, young people. Why put yourself through the frustration? Fellas, you know what you're, I know what I'm talking about. You start, you start stirring these feelings for this young lady and you all are flirting and you're, you're doing kissy-facey and all that kind of stuff and you're running around going, dear God, I can't control myself, Jesus. Oh, my mind is going crazy. All these lustful thoughts, Jesus, I'm never going to make it to marriage. Oh, God, Jesus. Why put yourself through that? Would you just put your mind on Jesus and enjoy this time in your life? So let me give you some nuts and bolts real quick, okay? Nuts and bolts. But I want you to catch those principles. And, 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 and I'm probably going to stir a lot of questions in your mind. That's good. I want you to. Listen, I want to recommend a book to you while I'm thinking about it. Teenagers, go out and buy the book, I Kiss Dating Goodbye. Joshua Harris wrote this book when he was 17 years old. He was a teenager when he wrote it, okay? And, and um, it's a great book. Uh, youth pastors, I want to recommend a second book to you, and that is Choosing God's Best. I think it's in the bookstore, Choosing God's Best. It's the best book I've ever read on courtship. But having said that, let me say this. Okay, how, Brother Richard, how in the world am I going to find my mate if I can't date? Here we go. How many of you realize that there's a, a verse in the Bible that says this? He that findeth a wife findeth a good thing. I love that verse. When I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God one question. I want to know why God did not put in the scripture a verse that says, She that findeth a husband findeth a good thing. Because personally, friend, I think I was a pretty good thing. You think a pretty good thing, don't you, Mike? You know, I, I think I was, I think I'm a pretty good thing. And my wife says, amen. I, I know she's screaming back there, you know. But listen. Now, what's that verse of scripture mean? If you do some Hebrew study, this is what that verse of scripture means. 
It means exactly this. How many of you have ever been like maybe walking to a friend's house or something, and you're walking down the sidewalk, and you look down, and you see a quarter? What do you do? You pick it out. Were you looking for the quarter? No, you were on your way to a destination, and as you were on your way, you saw the quarter, you picked it up. Did it change your direction? No, unless, you're, unless your friend's a crook, you just keep going to his house, okay? This is what that, you weren't looking for the quarter, it didn't change your destination. This, in the Hebrew, is what that verse means. You have a young man, he's going after Jesus. You have a young lady, she's going after Jesus. And as he is on his pursuit after the Lord, one day he looks over and he goes, Oh, hey, hey wife. And he picks up and he keeps going. Listen to me, fellas, if some of you would pursue the heart of God as hard as you pursue some of the hearts of your girlfriend, girls in your youth group, you would make Billy Graham look like a backslider, friend. Listen, you're on the pursuit of God and one day you look up and you go, there is she is. And let me tell you something, after you start dating, dating her, or after you start developing a relationship with her, your direction does not change. If you're called to be a youth pastor before you met her, you're called to be a youth pastor after you met her. If you were called to be a missionary before you met him, sweetheart, you're still called to be a missionary after you meet him. If you have to change your direction in life, that's not the one for you. So how does it work, Brother Richard? Here's how it works. You got John. John's now old enough. He's out of high school. Possibly out of college, his parents have told him, son, we feel like that you're ready to develop a relationship. And John one day is praying. He's just driving down the road or maybe he's in worship service or whatever. And, and all of a sudden, you know, he's just going after God. And all of a sudden he goes, whoa, Sally. Man, I never thought of Sally like that. And listen, it's not a hormone thing, fellas. It's not a lust thing. It's a spiritual thing. See, we say we live by faith in every area except for this one. And in this one, we live by hormone. We say we live by faith, and so he's praying, and man, he goes, Sally. And so all of a sudden, he starts praying about Sally. He goes, Lord, are, are you speaking to me about Sally? Da, da, da. And, and after a little while, after a couple of weeks or something, he goes, you know, I'm going to talk to my parents about this. So he goes, and he talks to his parents. He says, Mom, Dad, I want you to pray with me about something. He says, I feel like that the Lord's been speaking to my heart about Sally, you know. And uh, would y'all just join in me with prayer? And it's not a little five-minute prayer, young people. They take a couple of weeks or a couple of months and, and, they, and they spend some time looking at Sally and watching Sally because let me tell you something, nobody knows John better than mom and dad. They know the kind of woman that John needs that will make him the best man that he's going to ever become. And so they start praying about Sally and they start watching Sally at church and they start watching her at Walmart and in public places and watch how she behaves in public and, and the kind of character that she is. And then, and then if they feel good about it, they come back to John and they go, John, you have our blessing to pursue this relationship. If they don't feel good about it, they go, John, we just don't feel like that that's the one for you. And he starts all over again. But if they say, John, you have permission, then, then what John does is he doesn't go to Sally and say, Sally, pull the old Bible college stunt. Sally, God spoke to me and my parents and said that you're the one now I'm going to marry. No, fellas, no, 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 you, you, you don't do that, okay? What you do is you make an appointment with Sally's mama and daddy, more importantly, daddy, and you say, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, um, I'd like to have lunch with you one day, just the two of you. They go, okay, and, uh, and you take them out to lunch, son, you pay, okay? And um, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, um, you're probably wondering why I wanted to have lunch with you, and they go, yeah, yeah, I just kind of was wondering why. And he says, well, here's, here's the reason I want to have lunch. See, a few months ago, I was, I was just driving down the road, and all of a sudden, it just felt like the Lord began to speak to me about your daughter. And I've been praying with my parents, and my parents have been praying, and, and they feel good about me coming and talking to you today, and they've given me their blessing. And, and I'll just be real straight with Mr. and Mrs. Smith. I would like to begin to see your daughter, but I have pure intentions in mind. See, I don't want to just have fun with her. See, in the, if you watch old, story, old, old um, programs like... Um, um, Little House on the Prairie or My Three Sons or something like that. You know, what happened was back then is a young man would come to the door and he'd knock on the door and who would answer the door? Dad. 
And dad would always ask this question. Are your intentions honorable? And you go, well, now that you brought it up, I was really thinking about raping your wife, the daughter tonight. You know, I mean, what, what's that mean? Are your intentions honorable? What he meant by that question is, are you serious about my daughter as far as a possibility for marriage? Or are you just wanting to have fun at the expense of my daughter's heart? And you go to him, son, and, you, and, and some of you fellas are going, I could never do that. Fellas, again, if you don't have the guts to do this, you are not gonna, man enough to be gutsy enough to protect your woman after you get married. You've got to have, listen, fellas, we have too many yellow back, wrists, whippy wrist men nowadays. It's time for men to be men. And son, you sit down with, and, and by the way, fellas, if you do this right, you should only have to do it one time anyway. <laughs> And you sit down with Mr. and Ms. Smith, and you go, Mr. and Ms. Smith, you know, I, and here's my purpose and my intention. I would like to see your daughter, but I want you to understand that I'm not just wanting to have fun with her. I, I, I really believe, like, that maybe the Lord has created her to be my wife. And, um, and I would like your permission to pursue the relationship. And so I, I just lay that out for you to pray about it and think about it. And you give them time. Mr. and Ms. Smith then pray about it. And they watch Johnny, because let me tell you something. Nobody knows Sally better than Mr. and Ms. Smith. Sally's parents. They know her weaknesses and her strengths, and they know the type of man that she needs to protect her. And so they pray about it, and, and it's not a five-minute prayer. They pray about it a couple of weeks, a couple of months, however long they want. They watch Johnny. They see his character. And, uh, and then if they, if, they don't, if they don't feel good about it, they come back to Johnny, and they say, Johnny, we're sorry. We just don't, we just not, we don't think that it's God's will at this time. And see what I've done is I've protected Sally's heart. Now watch this. If, if Mr. and Ms. Smith feels good about the relationship and about the possibilities of them developing this relationship, what they do is they don't go tell Johnny, you know, you have our permission yet. What they do is they keep their mouth shut and they go to Sally. And they go, Sally, you don't realize this, but a couple of months ago, a couple of weeks ago, however long it was, um, Johnny came to our house and, and he took us out. And, and the reason he took us out is because he's very interested in developing a relationship with you. And, um, and we want you to understand that it's, he just doesn't want to have fun. But he, he really feels like that maybe you may be um, his wife one day. And we feel good about it, and, but we want your opinion. We want to know what you think. And so then Sally, what Sally would do is Sally would then begin to pray about Johnny. And J Sally will watch Johnny and, and, and those type of things. And, and you know what? If Sally doesn't feel good about it, what she does, she goes back to her parents and she says, Mom, Dad, Johnny's a nice guy, but I just don't see it. You know, I just, I, I, I just not, no bearing witness here, you know. <laughs> And, 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 and so then what happens is Johnny's parents then go back, I mean, Sally's parents go back to Johnny and they say, Johnny, we're sorry, but we just don't feel like that Sally's the one for you, especially at this time. And see, they don't say, Sally didn't like you. See, I'm trying to protect Johnny, too. See, they say, we, we just don't feel like that this is the will of God at this time. And Johnny does not know if it was Sally that rejected him or if it was his parent, her parents that rejected him. I'm trying to protect him as well. Now watch this. If Sally says, you know what, I feel good about this, then Sally's parents then say, you have our permission and our blessing to pursue this relationship. And from then on, they start the official courtship. Now let me tell you how courtship works real quick, and I'm, I'm coming to an end. I'm going to show a quick video, and then I'm going to leave you probably with a thousand questions. But listen. Listen to me carefully. I, I just want to wet, wet your whistle and make you dig in the scripture yourself. They say, okay, Johnny, you can pursue the relationship. They don't start hopping in a car together by themselves and running off to the movies. What they do, what they do is they start spending time with each other, with each other's family. You go, oh, my lands, why that, Brother Richard? Here's the reason why. Listen, Johnny, if you want to know about Sally, don't go take her off to a restaurant alone. Okay, now we're, here we go again, putting on our best face. If you want to find out who Sally is, go spend some time with Sally and her family. Because Sally has a little brother named Bert. And Bert will tell you everything about Sally. Hello. Sally, if you want to know something about John, go spend some time with John and watch the way John treats his mama. 
Because the way that Tron, John speaks and respects his mama is the way that he's going to treat and respect you one day. Spend some time with, with their family. And listen, here's the part that I'm really looking forward to. See, because, see, as Ashley's daddy, one day some poor fella is going to come up to me. And if he gets my blessing and, 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 and all this begins, here's, here's going to be the fun part. Because, see, I'm going to be able to take that young man one day underneath my wing, and for a few months I'm going to be able to mentor him. And I'm going to make sure that that young man that's going to be the husband of my daughter one day is, first of all, a real man of God. I'm going to make sure that he, that he understands this book and the principles in this book. I'm going to make sure that he understands how to run a budget. I'm going to make sure that he knows how to treat a lady. I'm going to make sure that he knows how to treat a lady not only in public, but even how to treat a lady in bed. I'm going to make sure that he understands how to treat a lady so that whenever my daughter is under his protection, that she's going to be in good hands. And I'm going to, and I'm going to be able to sit down with him and I'm going to say, let me tell you about Ashley. Let me tell you about Ashley. This is what Ashley likes. This is what Ashley doesn't like. This is her weaknesses. These are her strengths. Listen, don't ever say this to Ashley. Don't go there, son. Do yourself some favor, okay? Don't go here, okay? And I'm, see, here's the problem in marriage. We don't know each other. We think we do because we, you know, because we, we, we lock jaws really good. You know, a lot of people think they're in love when they're not in love at all. They're just in lust. They're in heat. You know what I'm saying? I know a lot of couples that when their lips aren't locked, their fists are. Hello. And, and we get married and we really don't know one another. Listen, fellas, wouldn't you love to have your girlfriend come? And, and you know, on Sunday afternoon, the guys are in there watching football and and mom, your mom's in there and saying, saying, to you, saying to your future wife, you go, let me tell you about Johnny. Here's Johnny's strengths. Here's his weaknesses. Help. He needs help here. Oh, boy, does he need help here. And you know, strength, here, here's his strength. Da, da, da. And, and, and here, oh, here's the part I love. Fellas, let me tell you something. You want to go into culture shock, I'm going to warn you right now. If you want to go into culture shock, go from mama's cooking to her cooking. We're talking about, okay, most of the time we're talking culture shock. But watch this. Sal Sally goes over to Johnny's house, and while Johnny's in there watching football or something, Sally's in the, in the kitchen with Mama, and Mama goes, hey, would you like to know Johnny's favorite dish? And she goes, oh, would I love to know. She goes, his favorite dish is lasagna. Really? Would you like to know how I make it? And Mama starts teaching Sally how to make lasagna. And, 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 and one day, after, after going through this process, one day, Sally actually makes the lasagna instead of Mama. And, and, and the lasagna is ready, and it's on the table, and, and, and they go, Johnny, uh, Dad, boys, come on in here. And Johnny walks in there, and he goes, lasagna, oh, Mom, my favorite dish, oh, Mom. And he's dipping out this big old scoop, and he slaps it on his plate, he takes his fork, and he puts it out. Oh, Mom, nobody makes lasagna like you. And Sally's going, uh-huh, you're in for a treat, big guy. <laughs> What's she doing? She's learning how to please her man. He's learning how to please his woman. Let me say something, young people. I need to close because I'm out of time. But listen to me. I have a video that I want them to get ready to share. In fact, you can go ahead. Well, just get ready. Some of you may think, this, no way. But let me tell you something. Can I say something? Millions of teenagers across America are waking up and they're re realizing this. Dating is not working. Look at your friends' lives. Look at your own lives. And look at the shambles. Look at the lives that are being destroyed because of the process that we're trying to go through through romance. Just a couple of months ago, I taped off the TV a video that I'm going to show to you by Dateline. Now listen, youth pastors... Let me just save you a little, a little bit of headache. I cannot give you this video. I've tried every way possible for permission to reproduce and give this out. They will not give it to me. You'll have to call Dateline and get it yourself if you want it. Okay, so I just having said that. But how many of you realize that when 2020 or Dateline covers a story, it's not some little secluded thing, but it's a growing phenomena in America? I'm about to show you, I'm about to show you a video, and they can go ahead and start killing the house lights, a video by Dateline 
on, on how teenagers are going bananas and they're recognizing, they're recognizing that dating is not working and they're ready to go back to the way that God intended it to be. If you will, give it up for the video crew as they put it on the screen. A three-month-old, for almost two years, has a three-month-old baby. And Joshua Harris is also married now. He courted and got married, and they're now writing a, another book on uh, purity of marriage or something of that extent. So, um, young people, everybody just stand with me. I, need, uh, I think Laura's going to come and give you some instructions. I'm going to need you to clear out probably fairly quickly. Don't go anywhere. I know, listen, I know that a lot that I've shared with you has been different. And I don't expect you to leave this building going, well, I'm never going to date again. That's not my intention. Here's what I want you to do, though. I want you to pray about it. I want you to look at the scripture for yourself. I want you to do some homework. And I want you to be honest with yourself and say, you know what? There probably is a whole lot better way than a lot of my peers are doing it. I'm trying. Listen, young people, this is honest, goodness, truth. I have nothing to gain from this. I have nothing to gain. Even if you go out and buy the materials that I have out there, it's entitled a match made in heaven. If you buy it, I don't have anything to gain from it. I don't get one penny off of it. Not one penny. I have nothing to gain. I merely come out here and I share it with you because I believe in you and I want you to be free from concern. Listen to me. We catch a lot of flack from people in the Christian world about revival. But let me tell you what, I catch more flack. I get, I get more hate mail and I get made fun of more in this area than in any other area. Because I preach this everywhere I go. I was funny because I was talking to Mike, Mike Rowan a while ago when Jeannie was uh, ministering. And I said, Mike, have you heard my teaching on, on courtship? He said, no, but I heard about it. And I said, what did you hear about it? He said... Man, he said, they say, you're anti-dating, you're anti-everything. And, you know, I, I know I'm getting a reputation for being some cruel mean, but, you know, what? I really don't give a rip. Because you know why? Many of you are going to hear what I'm saying to you today. And if I, if I can keep some of you, if I can keep some of you from getting pregnant, if I can keep some of you from catching AIDS or some venereal disease... I don't care how many people I make mad, because with every person that gets mad, there's somebody that's going to be listening. And so, young people, I just challenge you. I challenge you. This is all I'm asking you to do. I've not come to change your mind. I challenge you to look in the Scripture and evaluate this area of your life and bring it in line with God's Word. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, I know, I know, Lord, in this room, there are hundreds upon hundreds of young people who don't care about what society says. They don't care about peer pressure. They don't care about what the movies say. All they want is the Word of God. And Father, you know the demonic attack against our homes and against our young people in this area. And Father, I've tried to do the very best to keep away from my biases and my opinions and try to only preach the Word of God and the principles of your Word. And I ask, Lord, that when these young people leave, that they would not so quickly reject what could possibly save them, but, Lord, that they would at least chew on it, that they would meditate upon it, and that they would do their own homework to see, as, as they did in Thessalonica, to see if what the preacher preached was really the Word of God. May they look and see if it's the Word, and if they come to that conclusion that it is, may they apply it to their lives. I ask it in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Before you leave.